Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be checking out a hardware combo that I think might be somewhat interesting for a more budget-oriented system. This is the Dell Optiplex 7020 Small Form Factor. These computers are abundant on the used market, and if you have the right connections to people at organizations who may be upgrading from these computers, you might even be able to snag one for free. In any case, this system supports Intel 4th generation desktop CPUs and DDR3 RAM, which means that it should still be a decently competent system. My particular 7020 here is currently specced out with an Intel Core i5-4590 and 8GB of DDR3 1600MHz RAM. But for today's video, I'm going to be maxing out this system with a new CPU, more RAM, and, as you may be expecting at this point, a new GPU. As I'm sure some of us are aware, considering how late I am to this, there's a new low-profile card available for upgrading Office PCs. That is, the RTX 3050 6GB. This is a card that's powered entirely through the PCI Express slot and is low-profile. Past that, there isn't too much special about it, other than that it's a somewhat expensive card being $190. To me, this seems like it will just be a cheaper version of the RTX A2000 6GB, which is a card that has been used several times in the past by other people to upgrade similar Office PCs. But anyway, I'm going to be pairing this card with 32GB of RAM and an Intel Core i7-4790 4-core 8-thread CPU. To get one of these Optiplexes with these specs and a 256GB SSD on eBay right now, it would cost about $135 US dollars. That is, of course, without the GPU. Adding the 3056GB brings the total cost of the computer up to a little over $300, which makes it a relatively inexpensive computer, assuming that it's capable of running things well. Now, the people who have been watching the B-roll closely up to this point have probably noticed an issue with my plan. That issue being that the 3056GB is a dual slot card, and the PCI Express X16 slot on this motherboard is the bottom of the two slots. This means that it can only handle a single slot GPU. However, conveniently, the back of the PCI Express X4 slot is not blocked by a piece of plastic, so an X16 card can plug into this slot and function just fine while only running at PCI Express X4, of course. Though, there is another consideration with this slot. That consideration is that this slot is only rated at 50 watts rather than 75. Due to the power draw of the RTX 3056 gig, a 75 watt slot would be required to provide all of the power needed. I used a multimeter to check the routing of the pinouts on the power pin sections of the two PCI Express slots in this Optiplex, and all of the power pins on the X4 slot and the X16 slot are connected identically to 12 volts, ground, and 3.3 volts. So this means that this slot isn't just partially connected or something, and unless there's some weirdness with trace thickness in the motherboard, I don't see why this slot can't provide 50 watts. It could be possible that it's rated as a 50 watt slot because it's only able to provide 50 watts if the other slot is loaded down with 75, but that's purely speculation. In any case, if you do put a graphics card like this into this slot, do be aware that it's technically out of spec and could be a problem, so ensure you're okay with that. After installing the new components into the system, I powered it on and installed Windows 10 so that I could test some programs. However, before getting some real benchmark numbers, I decided to run a worst case scenario stress test on the system. I did this to make sure that the power supply in this system would have no issue supplying sufficient power to the components under a full load because it doesn't have an absurdly high power output. So, after running both Cinebench R23 Multicore and Furmark at the same time for an extended period of time, I determined that the system was going to be sufficiently stable. The PSU in this tower is a 255 watt one, and my watt meter at the wall showed that the system was drawing about 170 watts. Considering that some of that is lost in the power supply, this means that the power supply isn't running anywhere close to its maximum output. Unless there is some massive transient, which I don't think any of the hardware in this computer will be causing, it shouldn't trip over current or over power protection on the power supply. Alright, moving on to the synthetic benchmark scores. Starting with Cinebench R23 Multicore, the system scored 4,344 points. In single core, the system scored 874 points. I also decided to run Cinebench 2024 because it has a good GPU test and this CPU is new enough to support it. Last time I tried to run Cinebench 2024 on older hardware, the CPUs didn't have the AVX2 instruction set, and it couldn't run because of that. In the CPU multi-core test this time, the i7-4790 scored 236 points. 
This test took forever to run though, and so I didn't do the single core test this time because I calculated that it would take over two and a half hours. What I did do, however, was the GPU test. Task Manager's GPU utilization readout is as broken as it always seems to be, but this test is in fact running on the GPU. The GPU score for the system, with its RTX 3056 gig, was 3,824 points. I will say that this score places the 3056 gig well below the 2070 Super, a card that can be had for around $200 on the used market. Obviously, the 2070 Super will never be a low profile card, and it draws significantly more power than this one does. But this should be an indication that the 3056 gig is not the best bang for your buck. The final synthetic benchmark that I ran on this system is 3 Mark Time Spy. In Time Spy, the system managed an overall score of 4485 points, with a CPU score of 4001 points and a GPU score of 4584 points, which isn't too bad. Now let's move on to a couple of games, and today I've decided to play several more modern titles that should push this system quite hard, because if the system can provide a good performance in these titles, it's likely to perform well in anything that is older or has simpler graphics. A quick side note before I start reading out these benchmarks, in the b-roll that I captured with my capture card, there is some horrible tearing. This is not visible when playing the games and is only an artifact of my recording device, so don't take that into account when analyzing the performance of this system. Starting with Forza Horizon 5 at 1080p native, 2x MSAA, and with the high preset, minus ray tracing, the system offered a more than playable performance. With an average frame rate of 48.8 FPS and 1% and 0.1% lows of 36.9 and 31.3 FPS respectively, this is a completely usable experience. There was no indication of any CPU bottleneck in this game, and once more, the overall experience was pretty decent. Now moving on to Halo Infinite, running at 1080p native with the high preset in an arena map with some bots, the system once more delivered a more than usable experience. Minus the fact that I was playing with a cheap mouse and using the computer's case as my mouse pad, I feel like the system was providing a performance that would be more than enough to play somewhat competitively with. The average frame rate was 65.4 FPS with a 1% low of 43.1 and a 0.1% low of 38. The lows are pretty decent, so the few stutters that happened weren't too bad. In all, another solid performance. Next up is Spider-Man Remastered, which will also be the only title I test ray tracing with today. But first, let's start out without ray tracing at 1080p native with the high preset. With these settings, while swinging around in the game, everything was looking pretty good. Once more, that tearing is entirely due to the capture card. An average frame rate of 55.2 FPS with a 1% low of 31.9 and a 0.1% low of 23.1 isn't a bad performance either. The stutters in this game were certainly a little more severe, but it was still totally playable. Keeping the previous settings, but this time flipping ray tracing to high, the performance, well, tanked. I believe that this card isn't really cut out for ray tracing, a belief that is definitely reinforced by the results of this test. It's likely you could get a better ray traced experience with this card if you dial the rest of the settings back a bit, but at that point, I'm not sure if the game will look better than just running it at high settings without ray tracing. In any case, let's talk about numbers really quick to quantify this performance delta. The average frame rate dropped from 55.2 FPS all the way down to 35.3, which is about a 37% drop. The 1% and 0.1% lows suffered majorly as well, dropping to 17.4 FPS and 11.4 FPS respectively. The system can pretty clearly provide a good performance in Spider-Man Remastered, as long as you don't turn ray tracing up too much. Now for the final game, Satisfactory. At 1080p with the medium preset, the game performed great. With an average frame rate of 69 FPS, the performance was pretty nice. As for the lows, however, they're abysmal. This is due to the nature of this game though, and therefore, I wouldn't blame these lows on the hardware, as the game stutters like this on any PC. Still, for reference, the 1% low was 7.7 FPS, and the 0.1% low was 0.5 FPS. However, the performance that this system offered in Satisfactory is really all that you could ever need for this kind of a game, and so, I think the system did great in this title. All right. That wraps up all of the gaming tests. There's one final test that I ran on this system though, and that is some video editing in DaVinci Resolve. With some 4K30 footage encoded in H.264 on a 4K timeline, 
the system was doing quite well, especially when compared to other systems that I've done this test on. A quick note, this footage for this test is stored on an external SSD that has enough bandwidth to support several streams of this footage. Playing back the footage was not too much a challenge for the system. Sometimes it would need a moment to catch up after some editing was done, but after giving it a second, it could play the footage back just fine. Clicking through the footage on the timeline could be somewhat sluggish at times, but nothing that isn't workable. And playing two simultaneous streams of this footage caused the system to slow down a bunch but it's still doing better than several other systems that I've tested like this. Overall, doing some simple editing with transitions and cuts was pretty easy on this system, even with this heavy 4K footage on a 4K timeline. Rendering the 1 minute 24 second timeline at 4K30 in H.264 took quite a while and seemed to be able to render at around 6 frames per second. However, when switching over to H.265, which seemed to shove the rendering load much more onto the GPU, the system was rendering the footage almost in real time. Time, seeming to hang around the 26 to 27 frame per second mark. Not too bad. I'd say that editing on the system is actually more than doable. Sure, it won't give the best experience, but even with this heavy footage without any proxies, it was doing acceptably well. With some lighter footage or maybe some proxies, I can imagine that this system could make for a decently capable editing computer. To wrap up this video, I'll say that I think the i7-4790 and the 3056GB is certainly an interesting hardware pairing. The 4790 doesn't seem to bottleneck the 3056GB much, if at all, and is still a reasonably capable CPU. As for the 3050, I think that this card has its place, even if it may be a somewhat niche one. The fact that it only uses slot power, and that it's available in a low profile form factor, is what makes it special, and, at least I think, a good upgrade over the GTX 1650 low profile card that was our only reasonable option for such a long time. However, the performance per dollar of the 3056 gig certainly isn't great. Something like a used 2070 Super would provide much better performance for about the same price, and a 2080 Super might be an even better option for maybe $30 more. Though, both of these cards obviously sacrifice the power draw and the form factor of the 3056 gig which are the two things that make it special. There is also the 4060 low profile, whose only caveats are that it requires an 8-pin PCI Express power connector and is quite pricey at around $330. For around that price, you can get a full fat 3070 Ti on the used market, which will absolutely destroy the 4060. Oh yeah, and if you're only shopping new, for a similar price to the 3056 gig, you could get either an AMD RX 6600 or an Intel Arc A750, both of which will beat that card significantly, but again, at the price of power draw and size. Whether or not this card or this hardware configuration is something that would be worth it to you isn't something I can give a conclusive answer on. However, the one thing that I can say for certain is that the 4790 is at least still an impressive performer in today's world, especially if you can score a system with one for a cheap price. It's able to support at least a decent GPU and doesn't seem to entirely choke in some CPU heavy tasks like video editing. Well, that's all that I have for you in this one. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.